good morning, uh, Stephen and Sarah. Without going into huge amount of details, could you please tell us a bit about yourselves and what your roles are at the Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Services? Yeah, my name's Steve Jordan. Uh, I'm a group manager um, and uh, I'm currently the prevention service delivery manager working for Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service. Uh, I've worked in the department for the last three years and um, I'm proud to say that um, we've we've gone through some uh, some significant developments over the last uh, couple of years in terms of the development of our home fire safety assessment. And um, so it's it's a pleasure to be able to talk about uh, that and also kind of like highlight those risks of fire to to everybody this, today. Morning, I'm Sarah Hardman. I'm the Prevention Development Officer for Home Safety for the Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service and I work in Steve's team. So my role is to work across the, the 10 boroughs of Greater Manchester to understand fire risk and how that affects fire safety in the home and to come up with our strategies and uh, tactics, policies, guidance, advice, um, that then feeds all our safety information that the public receive and, and also um, to develop our home fire safety assessment, which is sort of the key tool that we offer to the public to keep them safe at home. And that's a home visit. So I work with all our different um, internal um, departments and with our partners across Greater Manchester to try and identify the groups in the community that are most at risk of having a fire at home or being injured or killed in a fire at home and making sure that we get our advice and our interventions to those groups and people that need us the most and that does include people over 65 um, older people and they are a key group for us that we want to keep safe um, and that with the right advice and information we can keep safe. Hello I'm Chris then, Chris Vickers. Um, thanks for your introduction. It's really interesting to hear what, you, what you're about. Um, what are the typical events that could lead to a fire inside a home, especially for an older person? Um, so we know that typically in the home, there are five main causes of fire. So the top cause of fire in the home is still cooking. Um, and that accounts for nearly 50% of all accidental fires in the home. Um, so it's a real, a real issue. And underneath the, the umbrella of cooking come lots of different issues. So cooking with oil or chip pans, um, distraction or leaving your cooking attended, um, and so on and so on. And, and then the other four are electrical fires. So those that are caused by electrical appliances or equipment, whether that's because they're faulty or being used incorrectly or not serviced properly, perhaps the plug socket is overloaded. Uh, maybe the, the piece of equipment is being used in the wrong way. Um, and then the other three causes, we're then looking at candles, smoking, and fires and heaters. So those are our, our top five causes that, that are of most concern to us. Um, smoking is the top cause of fire deaths. So whilst cooking is the top cause of fires, smoking is the top cause of fire deaths. So... Those are the ignition sources, the things that cause the fire, but, but the thing, but fires don't start on their own, do they? Fires don't happen on their own. So in addition to the ignition source, you then need people. So the way that we live in our homes and some of the issues that some of us are living with around our health and our well-being um, can impact on those ignition sources and lead to the fire. So our behaviors and everything we do is, is something to be considered. So that might involve, do we have a safe bedtime routine? Do we keep our environment nice and clean and tidy and keep our exit routes clear? Do we have abilities or disabilities that might impact on A, a fire starting in the first place, and B, our ability to escape? So something like mobility, for example, um, might impact on a fire starting, and it might also prevent us from escaping in the usual way. And so we'll need a slightly different escape plan if we have limited mobility. So whilst there are five main causes, there are also contributory factors or profile factors that then create the story behind the fire starting. 
Steve, do you want to pick up and add? Yeah, um, I mean, Sarah's given us a really, really good detailed um, uh, account of, of all the fire risks, uh, really. But what I would say is, is from, from the fire services perspective, we are really minded of the fact that one of our key at-risk groups is uh, or are the old elderly. We, we, we do know that uh, anybody aged over 65, according to our data sets, is two times more likely to, to uh, die in a fire and anybody over 80 is four times more likely to die in a fire. And, that, and that's on the basis of reviewing our data over the last 10 years. But we do see significant increases in fire risk. So I, I think what's really important is, is we, we really advocate to anybody to, to take the opportunity where, where they can uh, to seek the advice and guidance from our website if they can gain access to it, or there is the availability to contact our, our contact centre, uh, and there is an 0800 number, which we can pass on, uh, to be able to get that free fire safety advice and actually have a crew, frontline delivery staff, whether it's our own prevention advisors or operational crews, to come around and offer that advice. Well, that's good, thank you. Can I just add a little bit to that? So I think, you know, what Steve and I are saying is that Fire risk usually comes about when issues are compounded. So when you have multiple issues, so you know perhaps you've got no working smoke alarms, layer on top of that a mobility problem, layer on top of that that you're a smoker, or that perhaps there's a sensory impairment, and um, perhaps you're unable to test your smoke alarms because of frailty. So generally, you know the, the incidents we have, particularly the serious incidents, are when you get this layering effect of risk factors. And that can, that can sometimes, unfortunately, be prevalent amongst older people who may have, you know, more layered health issues, perhaps, than, um, than some. How can older people safely enjoy having an open fire? Well, I mean, I, 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 you know, I can speak personally because I have an open fire myself. And I think there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a few things. Um, um, regarding the safety of open fires. I think one of the first main things is, you know, is making sure you, you get that chimney swept annually by a, a recognised uh, or approved chimney sweep. I think that's really, really important. We are beginning to see uh, nationally um, a trend whereby people are starting to reopen their chimneys. And that obviously causes us concern because there will always be an issue in terms of the quality of the lining of the chimney. And if a chimney hasn't been used for a number of years, there could be potential leaks, which, called, which could cause carbon monoxide leaks. So it is really essential that you get a, a recognised or registered chimney sweep to, 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 sweep, uh, to sweep that chimney. Um, the second thing as well is, is the type of fuel, making sure that you've got the right fuel to burn in that fire. Um, obviously, that, that means kind of like if you're going to use wood, that it's dried uh, and it's gone through a drying process because any moisture in the wood could cause kind of like uh, the, the fire to spit, so to speak, cause burns on carpets, etc. And the other thing as well is also obviously uh, things like smokeless coal as well. We wouldn't advocate anybody using any other kind of like uh, types of fuels uh, or, or any types of uh, wood in that sort of sense. So get it from a, 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 an approved trader. Safety around the fire is really important. So we would always advise that you use a proper fire guard and keep that in place. We understand that people will want to get close to the fire. Uh, and again, you know, we don't want items of clothing getting too close or catching fire. And there is the risk sometimes that if anybody is, is using any uh, emollient based cream uh, or skin treatment, which is oil based, obviously, if that gets too close to the fire, there is the risk that that, that could ignite as well. So it's, it's really essential that we you, you keep your distance, you keep it uh, uh, protected with a fire guard. The other thing to think about as well, which is really important, is ensuring that every, with every fire that you have, and that's actually whether it's a gas fire, but, but, but also an open fire that you have a carbon monoxide detector. I cannot stress the importance of that. Now, what's really important for anybody listening to this is 
if you are living in a rented property, whether that be a private landlord or social landlord, okay, there is something called the smoke and carbon monoxide alarm regulations. And that clearly stipulates that uh, since 2015, that there should be the provision of a carbon monoxide detector for any solid fuel fires, which is open fires. But as of the 1st of October this year, those regulations changed and were amended to, in, uh, to include as well gas fueled fires. So that could be for boilers, but also for, for gas fires as well. The carbon monoxide alarm is an absolute essential um, because, you know, as they, as they say, it is the silent killer. Um, and we know that open fuel fires can present a significant risk of carbon monoxide if the chimney is blocked, if the fuel isn't burning properly, or actually sometimes you can get, certainly during periods of high winds, downdrafts down the chimney. For those that have got an open fire will we'll, we'll understand what I mean. Sometimes you see the visible signs of the smoke being pushed back down. It is very rare when that happens, but it can happen. It certainly happened in my house. And then what I would say is if anything like that does happen, what you have to do is open the window slightly to create that flow back into the house again, to push the buoyant gases back up again and regulate that chimney. So that's really important. And then the final thing I would say is, is, is whenever you're not using the chimney, okay, what I would also advocate is getting something called a chimney bloom. Okay, and the chimney bloom is something that you can just place above the half, okay, and, and inflate it. So what it does is when you're not using the fire, okay, you're, you're not losing any further draft. They reckon a third of your room uh, temperature can disappear up the chimney, okay, when you're, when you're not using it. So making sure you block those drafts is absolutely essential to keep yourself warm. But obviously, if you're going to have the fire, make sure you remove the chimney bloom prior to um, sort of igniting it. Okay, thanks for that. Given scares about rising energy bills and power cuts, people may be stocking up on candles. What should people consider if they are doing so? Do you want me to go this one, Steve? I mean, there's, there's the general advice that we would give about candles um, at any time, really, which is um, don't leave them unattended. So never leave them unattended. Um, and if you do leave the room, make sure that you extinguish the candle properly. So if you're burning candles, check before bed in particular that you've extinguished any, any candles. Um, they need to be in a proper holder, so a proper candle holder and fixed firmly so that they won't fall over. Um, and only place them on heat resistant surfaces. So you know the little tea lights that you can get, they should, they should in particular, they should go into a proper holder and not onto a, a surface such as a bath, for example. And we don't really like people burning candles in the bath, not particularly a safe practice. So heat resistant surface, proper holder, put them out properly, especially before bed, and don't leave them unattended. Um, people should think about pets and children. So um, if you have a family pet or, or children in the home, keep candles away from them because they can easily get knocked over and keep them away from any draft. So if the window is open and there's a curtain flapping around, you don't want that near to a candle because it could catch light. Um, I think um, considering the question you asked about the, the, the current cost of living rise, um, we may find that people are looking to candles to, to heat or light the home, um, neither of which we would recommend. Um, we don't really recommend walking around with a candle. Um, there are better alternatives such as torches, and of course, nowadays you can get um, LED candles, can't you, that are a really good alternative. If people are looking for, for sort of ambience and atmosphere, the LED candles are a lot safer. Um, so certainly, um, if you are, are looking to candles um, in the, during the energy crisis, then um, I would say, you know, use them safely as I've described and, and certainly don't be walking around the property with them for light. Steve, do you want to add? Yeah, if you don't mind, I mean, it, 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 uh, it's, I mean, I, I, what Sarah said is, is you know, I, I, I can't add anything further onto that specific area, but, but what I think is really important to, to promote as well is, is, 
I understand that people will be very concerned and worried about the, the, the energy crisis and about heating bills. Um, I attended an event two weeks ago and it was quite interesting in, in the sense of I hadn't fully appreciated that approximately there is £70 million worth of unclaimed benefits within the Great Manchester region. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's quite an astounding figure that there are many people, different ages, um, who aren't aware of their full entitlement, uh, especially when it comes to things like heating subsidies or, or supporting benefits. Um, I understand that there is going to be most probably a, a concern and almost like a, an action uh, by people to go and get candles because they feel that that's the, the only alternative fuel source, heat source, light source that they've got available. And I would really stress that, you know, if there's an opportunity for anybody to, to go to their little, uh, to their Citizens Advice Bureau or to engage with any uh, charity such as Help the Aged, to ask the question about what benefits they are entitled to. And I think that's really, really important because if we can support them in trying to find alternative means rather than having to go to candles, then I think, I think we would really, really promote that. And I think the Priority Services Register as well, Steve, which I'm, yeah. you, you may well be aware of, Chris and Pauline, it's quite important that older people register on the Priority Services Register so that if there is a problem with their energy supply, they're prioritised um, as somebody who may be more vulnerable and they yeah, require I'm, I'm support. On, <coughs> I'm on all of those. Yeah. Water, gas, electricity, everything. Great. I think I think what, what, what I'm really concerned about is that sorry again is is i read a really interesting article at the weekend and it, and it was talking about uh the plus 65 um community and we've got to understand that there may be many people that aren't digitally connected okay that may not sort of be aware of that but actually there'll be a number of people as well now looking at their household bills and actually now cancelling their internet connections as well um and actually there, there's becoming it's becoming actually you know a huge area of exclusion because if you need to adjust anything you need to go to a better bill you need to review anything everything now is based online so you know if we can say to people in terms of getting the message out to say you know that is not the only route you know you can still sort of make a phone call you can still go to somebody to get this advice i would really strongly advocate that you do that Okay, thank you for that. Uh, just a link question then on that. People may also be sourcing portable heaters, some of which may be dodgy in terms of noxious emissions or general safety standards. Is there guidance we should follow to stay safe with portable heaters? Yeah, there is, yeah. Um, again, the, the information, you can find it on the website or you can contact us and we'll, we'll go through it. We have literature that we can provide as well. So we can always provide people with literature. Um, so some of the advice around portable heaters um, is the same as the advice around open fires. So it's about making sure that you don't sit too closely to a heater. We always say at least, at least a meter or three feet away. Um, don't dry your clothes on a portable heater. And if you are going to dry your clothes, keep them well, well away from it. But it's also about making sure that if you're going to buy a portable heater, that you buy it from a reputable manufacturer. Um, if you can afford to buy um, a brand new one, that's better than buying second hand. Always make sure that you have it serviced and checked properly. Um, and if possible, plug it in, into a single plug socket. So in order to try and avoid overloading each plug socket, one appliance per socket is much safer than using an adapter and plugging lots of different plugs into it because then you risk overloading your socket. Uh, yeah, if, if, if that's okay. So, I mean, again, there's, there's a couple of options here. I mean, if you were going to use a portable heater, you know, uh, it would be perhaps suggestible that an oil-based kind of like radiator, which is a plug-in, would be a, a better option. Or a, or a convection heater. But um, if you do have a gas heater, uh, make sure that it, you know, it does conform to the British standards and it's, and it's serviced. But, but if you're going to change the cylinder as well, if it actually has a cylinder, 
Try to make sure that you do that within the open air or otherwise open up windows and doors to increase the ventilation. Make sure you check the valve on the empty cylinder is closed before disconnecting it and don't turn the valve uh, of the new cylinder until it's securely connected, okay? And then if you do have any spare cylinders, keep them upright, keep them outside, never store them in basements or under stairs or in cupboards containing electrical meters or, or equipment. So again, it's just very simple advice because we do know that some people will have kind of like gas bottled uh, portable heaters. <coughs> What precautions should people, older people take to reduce the potential risk of a fire at home? Right, where to start? I mean, the, the, the first key message is to, to fit smoke alarms, to fit working smoke alarms. So um, the recommendation is to fit at least one per floor in your home. So at least one working smoke alarm per floor. And if, you, if you're using lots of rooms and some of those five main causes of fire that we talked about are sort of present in those rooms, then fit additional alarms in the rooms where, where risk is most likely. But one per floor, preferably in your circulation space, so your hallway or landing is the minimum. And to fit a heat alarm in your kitchen. We've already talked about cooking being the top cause of accidental fires in the home. So a heat alarm in the kitchen is also very important alongside your carbon monoxide alarm that Steve talked about previously. So make sure your alarms are fitted and make sure they're working. So in Greater Manchester, we ask that they're tested uh, once a week by pressing the test button in the middle and you'll hear it sound and chirp. And that means that it's working. Now, for, for people that are unable to do that, um, in answer to your question, what can people do to keep safe? It's about trying to engage friends and family and neighbours um, in assisting you to stay safe. Um, so if you have a neighbour or a friend or a family member who can test that alarm for you um, every week, perhaps when they visit, that can be part of their routine, um, then that can assist people who are unable to test their own smoke alarms. And of course, some people may be unable to respond to a sounding smoke alarm. Um, and in those cases, we'd like to work with, with those people and their, um, the people that support them, again, whether that's other professionals or family members, to try and find a solution that works for them. And that may be in the form of assist assistive technology. But maybe that some people can have their smoke alarms linked up to a telecare system, for example, um, that automatically calls a call centre if the alarm is triggered. Um, for people who have um, a hearing impairment, um, we fit um, a particular type of alarm that is linked by a, a, a Wi-Fi signal to a, a vibrating uh, pad that can go under your pillow and a strobe light so that if the alarm is triggered, if the smoke alarm is triggered, both the pad and the strobe light activate and that can give a warning to people that are unable to hear a sounding smoke alarm. So it's really important to, to think about um, whether people are able to respond to a sounding smoke alarm and, and then escape, um, you know, take, take um, action to escape. And if they aren't, then we can work with them and other agencies to try and find out what the best solution is for them. And there is assistive technology out there to support that. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing they should do is to make sure that they do have a safe nighttime routine that before bed there is a ritual or a routine that the person or the family go through um, to make sure they're safe at night time. That will include switching everything off, shutting internal doors, having access to a telephone in case they need to call 999, um, and so on and so on. And also making sure that they have an escape plan that works for, for them, that works for their household. So they know which way they would escape, from the home in the event of a fire at night time and they know what to do um, and again we can um, we can run through things like escape plans with people and households and um, that are specific to their household layout and their family setup and um, so your smoke alarms your nighttime routine your escape plan make sure that you stay well if possible seek help and support to stay well because people who are well are less likely to have a fire so the more we can stay mobile and well, um, the less likely we are to have a fire and the more able we are to escape. 
keep your home environment as clean and tidy as you can and make sure that your exit routes are free from belongings so that if you have to exit the building you can and again seek support with that if you're unable to keep on top of that there are organizations out there who can support you um, and really the other thing is make the um make use of our offer of a home fire safety assessment so um Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service offers home fire safety assessments across the 10 boroughs of Greater Manchester to people who are eligible for them. So there are two ways you can request a visit. You can go online onto our website and fill in an online home fire safety check. And there are benefits to that. That will give you some advice there and then online around your home fire safety. But at the same time, it will figure out whether or not you're eligible for a home visit. And if you are, you'll be invited to fill in a referral form, a short form with your name and address and submit that. And we will then make contact by the telephone to book you an appointment. And uh, our staff will come out and do a home visit. And we're very friendly. It'll either be firefighters or um, staff called prevention advisors, all in uniform and all carrying ID. Um, and they'll come out at, a, at an arranged time that works for you and, and do the visit. And they'll talk to you about your home and your behaviours and your habits. And they'll give you fire safety advice that meets your needs. And um, they'll probably have a, a look around your property with your permission um, to try and identify if there are any hazards. And they'll talk you through how to reduce those. And while we're there, we'll fit smoke detection if that's needed. We'll fit smoke alarms for you if it's needed and talk you through your escape plan. And, and those people without online access can also request a visit and they'll do that by ringing our contact centre on our free phone number, which is 0800 555 815. Um, so if you ring that number, they will talk to you and find out whether or not you're eligible for a visit. And if you are, they'll arrange that visit for you on the telephone. So people can either refer themselves, so they can make a self-referral, um, or they can refer other people. So professionals or neighbours or friends and family can refer other people on their behalf if that's easier. Um, but we do need that person's permission um, in, in order for us to, to go ahead and visit them. So there are lots of things you can do at home yourself to keep the environment clean and tidy and well-maintained, to keep yourself well, to make sure that your home is protected with smoke alarms. But actually, we would like to come out and visit you, particularly if you're over 65, and go through all that with you and provide advice, support and equipment if possible. And if, if, um, if you're eligible for that uh, in a home fire safety assessment. Hello, I'm back again now. Um, how important, well, we've been, talked a lot about carbon, uh, about um, alarm systems. How, how do we know that they're working properly? Carbon monoxide system and smoke alarm systems, and you've also mentioned the heat alarm. How do we know they're all working properly as they should be? Yeah, I, I can answer that. Um, so obviously, um, we, we absolutely advocate that um, each home should be fitted with a smoke alarm and as we've discussed, a, a carbon monoxide uh, alarm as well. In terms of testing, what we advise is for both alarms to be tested at least regularly once a week. Now, we, we understand that it's going to be difficult sometimes for people to be able to test a smoke detector that's on the ceiling. So we would say, you know, if you can, if you've got a broom or a mop or something like that, what you can do is you can then just use that to test the smoke alarm. OK, and you know, depending on the, the, the type of smoke alarm that you have, it, it, it will kind of like go into a, an alarm mode and, and that's, that's your test. In terms of the carbon monoxide to test uh, alarm itself, uh, it's the same principles again, you know, many carbon monoxide detectors now have a five or 10 year sort of guarantee uh, and they're fitted with um, kind of like your, your standard types of AA batteries. And there will be a, a test button on that alarm. So what we would say is if, if there's a particular uh, event or something that you do regularly once a week, for example, you take the bins out uh, or you make a phone call to somebody, you know, every week, try to align your testing to that so you don't forget. So, and, it, and it's a really good practice to get into. 
Um, so yeah, um, Sarah, have I missed anything there? No, I don't think so. I, I guess just to say that um, if somebody does think that their alarm is faulty or it's, it's sometimes in the cold winter months, they can chirp repeatedly because of the cold. Um, and if, if you do think it's faulty, then um, if, it's, if it's one of our alarms supplied by our supplier, you can ring them and the number is usually found on the little leaflet that comes with the alarm. Um, so you can telephone them and usually they will send a like for like replacement um, in the post. Now, if you're unable to, to refit that alarm yourself, then you can ring our contact centre, that number I mentioned before, that 0800 555 815 number, which is free phone. And they'll try and talk through with you whether or not, you know, you can perhaps give it a little bit of a clean um, with a dry cloth or the hoover nozzle. And, and if that um, works, great. But if it doesn't, they will arrange for somebody to come out and refit it if the alarm is still under guarantee. And if it was an alarm that Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service provided. Um, so, yeah, if you're worried about it, if it's making odd noises when it shouldn't be and you've not pressed the test button, um, then there are routes that you can use to, um, to report that defective alarm and we will help you with that. Thank you both. Finally, how will technology shape fire safety going forward? Shall I answer that question, Sarah, as a starting point or? Yeah, you go for it. <laughs> I think what, what's been really fascinating over the last couple of years is that there has been some really, really dramatic and positive advancements in technology. I mean, obviously, the first major advancement was was just the smoke alarms itself. And I, I believe, what, what was it, 20 years ago now, you know, the times when they did their, you know, the, the most uh, the, the most amazing or the most effective invention in, in that century was the smoke alarm, because it's such a simple invention and it saves so many lives. But actually, there's been some really, really fascinating developments over the last couple of years. So one of them that I mentioned earlier on is, is now you can get smoke alarms and the heat alarms that can actually attach, uh, that they are actually fitted and you can actually get a phone app. And I think that's a really, really important advancement for, for many families um, who have concerns about uh, their, their, their loved ones or elderly family members. We, we understand that many people want to continue to live independent lives and I think that's really important. But, you know, um, in terms of increased frailty, mobility, um, memory loss, um, there are going to be naturally concerns. So um, if you look around on, on the market now, you can get smoke alarms that have, their, that have its own broad, you know, wireless router. So if the alarm does go off, a family member will be alerted by the app. And it gives them a chance to be able to phone up to find out how they are, is it, if anything's wrong, if it's burnt toast or whatever. So I think that's the first thing. The other thing as well is you can get uh, another product and it's on our website as advice. And it's a product called a cooker cutoff device. Now, it is uh, for electric cookers and it works on um, um, artificial intelligence and sensors. Uh, it needs to be fitted by a qualified electrician but it, it sits above the hob and when the, 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 the cooker gets to a certain temperature, it basically cuts the cooker off. And it's great because, you know, we're, as, as Sarah's alluded to, one of our biggest incident call outs is cooking fires. And often it's uh, uh, food that's left unattended or a pan of food um, left unattended um, because somebody's, you know, memory loss, distraction uh, or whatever. So it, it increases that level of safety. In terms of gas, um, even though there's no, uh, to my understanding currently, a, a electrical device, Cadent Gas can fit a, an actual very simple cut-off device for the, at the rear of the cooker. And again, if any family members are, are worried about um, somebody you know, living on their own independently and cooking, and they want to uh, arrange um, you know, support services for food, but they, they you know, they're the family member keeps turning the cooker on, you can actually get this cooker cut off at the rear of the cooker and it just isolates the gas. And that's something that's promoted by Cadent Gas as well. So there's a, a couple of forms of assisted technology. The, the final thing as well is, is every local authority does have 
uh, an assisted technology or sensory department um, that, that you can actually contact and they can undertake an assessment as well. So as Sarah, Sarah's just said, there is telecall services. Uh, there's also uh, support for harder hearing alarms. And, you know, I, I would really, you know, again, promote that for people uh, getting in contact because you are entitled to those services and it is something that you can look for. And if that improves that level of safety for, for you in the home and it's available for you for free, um, then, you know, it's, it's something that we would promote. And, and what we will do is when we do a home fire safety assessment with somebody, if we come across somebody who wouldn't be able to successfully respond to the alarms we fit, so we fit single standalone units with a 10 year battery. So ours are not interlinked unless we're linking them up for somebody who's hearing impaired with one of those strobes and vibrating pads. Um, so if, if, we, if the equipment we don't provide isn't sufficient for that person, we are taking a person-centered approach. So we would then support that person to liaise with social care um, and trigger a needs assessment, or we would do that for them on their behalf, depending on their needs. So when we go into somebody's home to do the visit, part of our, um, part of our job when we go into that home is, is yes, to provide advice and equipment, but also to signpost people and refer them and advocate on their behalf to make sure that, they, um, that their home is properly protected um by, by working with our partners really so it is a partnership effort it's really important that we work in partnership because we don't have all the solutions at our fingertips and um, we have to we have to work with social care and other partners to make sure that people have the right care and support at home just one more thing about technology um i mean there's loads of ways you could look at tech isn't there so just just because smoking is our top cause of fire deaths and smoking prevalence amongst the adult population is declining which is a positive thing but for people that do um, do smoke you know when you think about technology even your your e-cigarettes your vapes are a risk reduction method really so for people that do smoke and are unable or, or don't want to quit um then a switch to an e-cigarette is another way that technology has sort of come to the forefront of risk reduction. And I know that, the, you know, the public health message is that they are 90% safer with regards to health because they don't contain tobacco, they contain nicotine, not tobacco. But from a fire safety perspective, even though it's an electrical device, so it's not risk free, um, we haven't seen the same number of incidents with e-cigs and vaping as we do with um, tobacco smoking. Uh, particularly when, when fire deaths are concerned. And of course, the best thing somebody can do to reduce that fire risk is to make a quit attempt. Um, and again, you know, we will support people, and put them in touch with services that can help them to do that. Um, but if they're not ready to quit or they don't want to quit, there are other ways you can reduce that fire risk if you do smoke. Smoking outdoors is another example. Well, certainly the technology has a role to play with most of our risks. Um, cooking, as Steve described, but also around smoking. There is tech there that can reduce the risk a little bit. Um, 